of us. <laughs> <laughs> very is, fluid project, Naomi. <laughs> very fluid, but very fun. So and it just got a little bit more fun yesterday. <laughs> I know, I know, I think I know, right? So that's exciting. I feel like I, my intuition feels good about that. So it's exciting. Cool. Well, everybody calling in, be sure to use the locate chat box because that's our main Zoom. Drop in name and where you're calling in from. Or let's see. Let's see if I can find the chat box. Bonnie Walker from Bend, Oregon. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Meredith Noble from Valdez, Alaska. Just like Maggie. Naomi, Middletown, Connecticut. Cool. Yeah, sweet. Cool. I actually don't know where Anna is located. I forget. Bigfoot and country. Crescent City. Is that by Nevada? Uh, not Nevada, the town. This, isn't there a city called, is it Nevada City? Crescent City. By uh, Rockland? Is it by Rockland? No, uh, we're like at the Oregon, California border. So uh, uh, Brookings, Oregon is right next to us. And that's about it. We're like three hours from anything else. <laughs> okay, rock on. So wait, all righty. Um, Anthu, am I pronouncing your name correctly? You're welcome to unmute yourself and correct me if I need it. From Orange County, California, also another warm place. <laughs> Patricia. So nice to see you, or not see you, but hear you from Toke. Very cool. Um, and Anna, Crescent City. Cool. And Adam in Florida, but lives in Anchorage. Cool. Well, we'll give people a couple more minutes. Ah, right on. James, Starzak. Gosh, you never know who's going to show up to a webinar. Hi. <laughs> How you doing, Meredith? Man, I'm good. I haven't talked to you in a while. Cool. Well, James is in Anchorage, as far as I know, unless you're somewhere else cooler. Kathy Cheddar in Mid Midlothian, Virginia, if I pronounce that right. Cool. I don't even know where that is. All right. Patricia wins on the temperature of minus 34 below this morning in Toke. So who has the warmest weather? I'm going to guess that that's Anthu or maybe... Anyone calling from Florida? Carol Fletcher, welcome. Deborah Wright, hello. Mike Gardner, Hayward, Wisconsin. Thank you. Hey. 80 degrees, Adam, so far winning the high-end degree, high-end thing here. Peggy Brockman, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, 68 and sunny. Jenna, hello, from Anchorage. Right on. Jenna, you've been crushing it with the course content. Debra in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Cool. Lenore, hello. I see you there as well. Drop in your in the chat box. Hi, Victoria. She's getting connected. Wow, cool. We have all, all sorts of lovely faces that I and names I recognize. Sarah Kinzer, welcome. Drop in on the chat box where you're calling in from. Kathleen, hi. Your picture is super pretty. It looks great. Um, Sarah Mueller. Kathleen, which Kathleen? I'm so curious, we have a few. Lenore, Springville, Missouri, rock on. Oh, and also it turns out we're also live on Facebook. So if anyone's watching it, uh, is watching us there, they're also welcome to drop in where you're at um, on Facebook and Alex will see that. Victoria, camera off now to eat lunch. Oh, I so get that. I made that mistake once. We uh, were a part of a an online course too and it was a really early 7 a.m. morning and, and uh, so I'm eating breakfast while we're on the call and then it's of course recorded live and I saw the replay on Facebook later and I was just like that is embarrassing like you don't want to see yourself eating <laughs> so I totally get it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah cool Kathleen in Porcel Portland Oregon. I was about to say Porcello Oregon but that's your last name. Sarah nice to see you from Wisconsin. Kathleen, that Kathleen from Nan Nanilchik, from Alaska, mm -hmm. Nanilchik, Alaska. Hey, how do you actually pronounce your name? And I should know this. Mer is it Mer Mercia? 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 You might need to correct me. I actually can't believe I don't know this by now. Cool. 
Cool. We have other faces and names. Merce. Merce. Did I say that correctly or Merce? Mer, 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 Merce. Beautiful name. Merce. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Heck yeah, welcome, really cool. I'm, I'm, it's so funny, I've seen your name so many times, but I guess when you see a name, you don't have to pronounce it out loud. So it kind of puts me on the spot to see if I could do it. And I goofed it up, so now we know, Merce. Um, all right, Julie Stricker, welcome. Neil, hi. Uh, find the chat box and drop in where you're calling in from. And heck, we're on, the, we're on 11, so we're gonna get this party started. Neil, calling in from Kansas City. Woohoo, gotta have some Midwest rep. Nicole down in Homer, rock on. Sweet. Well, let's get this party started because we have a ton to cover. Wow, look at all these really lovely faces. Terry, Lisa, Taryn Olson, hi. Nice to see you. Ramo, hello. Cool, I could just go on and on because I'm pumped to see these lovely uh, familiar, familiar names and some new ones, which is really cool. And hey, Harvey in Minnesota. So we have got to get underway because we've got a lot to cover. So I am super excited to introduce you guys today to Kate um, Holman Billmeyer, who I'm gonna give you an intro on her first, but I have to tell you that the importance of today's webinar was really driven home this morning. So we received notification that we were not successful with a grant that we, uh, our team had pursued this summer. And what was so fascinating about it was when we, they actually gave us the, it was an extremely tough grant and they gave us back the scorecards to uh, illustrate your strengths and our weaknesses. And the week, the area where we were weak, where we lost points was in the evaluation because we didn't illustrate how the program was, it was a language preservation grant, how we were actually going to like measure if the language was being preserved and the objectives of the program. And we weren't clear on the objectives. There were kind of too many all over the place. So I feel like, boy, we would have benefited from this webinar pre going into that grant. So I just have to emphasize that this stuff really, really, really matters. Um, I think it would have had a huge difference on us actually winning that grant versus not winning it. But now we'll know how to strengthen it for next year in a resubmit. I'm going to go into that in more detail during next week's coaching call and actually share all of that stuff with you after we do like a full sort of debrief detox on it. But I think it really set me up kind of almost serendipitously weird that that would come in today. And then this is what we're talking about. So let me do a quick intro on Kate. So Kate uh, Kate is down in Seldovia, Alaska with her family, but and her and her husband have started a really cool company and it's called Wellspring Group Consulting. And so they focus on community based research, uh, data driven program evaluation, stakeholder engagement and grant development and management. She actually took our course um, earlier this year to kind of finesse and uh, kind of fine tune her grant writing skill set. And so that's how we got to know each other. So since 2010, Kate has actually taught political science and women's studies at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And she is in, um, and in the Bachelors of Social Work program at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So she, in the past, she's worked for the Institute of Social and Economic Research. And they, she was on the monitoring and evaluation team of a multi-year federally funded health project. So very, very complex, I'm sure, on the evaluation front. And then now she and her husband work as, in, uh, as consultants in rural Alaska, often doing projects like conducting studies on the impact of development on subsistence practices. Um, prior to this work, she worked as an at an international NGO focusing on helping women living in conflicted, affected countries recover from war. Uh, so she got her BA in political science and international affairs from the University of Mary Washington, her master's in women's studies from George Washington University. I've been to that campus, it's so beautiful. And she received her PhD in development studies from the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies in 2014. So she's really smart. I hope that's what everyone else took away. When I was reading that bio, I was like, hot dang, we have some smart students. So Kate, where I gotta oh, find you and all these beautiful faces, there you are. I am gonna shut up and mute myself and let you take us from here. But thank you so much for coming and teaching us. I'm stoked to be a student. Thank you. Wow, that was a lot. Um, welcome <laughs> everyone. <laughs> thank you for taking time out of um, what is 
I'm sure very busy lives and things happening to listen to what I have to say for 45 minutes. Um, so thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I am going to give you all a little bit of a roadmap for where we're headed today. Um, I just like to let people settle into the, our trajectory of, of what we're doing. Um, so to give you a small introduction, which Meredith did a great job of doing, um, we're going to do a short little check-in. I'm going to give a brief overview of evaluation because um, I could talk for a long time about it, but consolidating it down to just a brief um, key points. And then more specifically, kind of getting into um, the meat of it, and that is, how is this beneficial to your practice of grant writing? How can we tie those things together? Um, we'll do a brief check out, and um, I'm going to leave you with some tools and a little um, short uh, homework is maybe not the right way, but uh, it's a way to think about taking this information forward into your practice. Um, so by the end of our time together, uh, you should be able to really explain what evaluation is, outline why evaluation is important to grant writing, um, discuss three ways that you can incorporate evaluation into grant writing, explain at least three things that you shouldn't do when it comes to evaluation and grant writing, and then have three solid tools to utilize in your practice. So that's where we're headed. Um, and so Meredith gave a really nice overview and introduction of my kind of professional background and practice. Um, I am speaking from my home in Seldovia, Alaska today, where I live and work um, on the lands of the Sukpiak peoples. Um, I, like Meredith said, I have a background that's kind of steeped in academia and research, um, but I've pivoted towards uh, doing a little bit more of this consulting work most recently. Um, and so really utilizing an asset-based framework in these kinds of approaches that we take with our community-based research efforts and stakeholder engagement um, and program evaluation. And so, um, that's why I'm here to talk with you today uh, to give you a sense of what it means to have program evaluation and how to better utilize that skill set um, and knowledge in your own grant writing practice. Uh, so one of the things that we do in our program evaluation practice is evaluation facilitation. And that just means helping stakeholders decide what an evaluation's primary purpose is going to be. You know, why are you doing an evaluation? Why do you need it? Um, helping organizations think about what success looks like. Um, how to prioritize some of your evaluation questions. Inevitably, there will be, like Meredith said, lots of objectives and lots of things to think about. Um, how do you prioritize those things? Um, I help folks determine appropriate, credible, and affordable methods for engaging with evaluative work um, and making these decisions with attention um, to how and by whom the evaluation processes and findings will be used. Um, so who is going to, you're going to do all this work to collect information, but who is it going to um, be serving, who is it going to be useful to? And so that's really at the heart of the work that we do is um, having a utilization focus. So um, keeping use front and center. What's going to be the most useful information um, or data to know that you are achieving your stated goals? So with that being said, um, I want to do a quick uh, poll for folks about um, a couple of questions. What does evaluation mean to you? I want to get a pretty good sense of um, where folks are at, where they're coming from in their knowledge about evaluation so that we can really build a foundation together and take everybody up kind of to the, from the foundation up to the top floor. So getting a good grounding in where folks are at. And so um, I'm utilizing this program called AHA Slides. And if you're on a phone, you can just scan this QR code to join, um, or you that can- Definitely is the way that works the best. I lost my phone, here it is. This so I totally recommend doing it because then you don't lose the slides. Like just pull up your camera. 
if you're not challenged like I am and just pull it, hold it right over the QR code and it totally pull, pulls the survey up or click on the link. Is that how that works? Did I do it right? There we go. Woohoo. Okay. Everyone else get that to it just like hover over it and you got the link popping up. Yay, I see people populating there at the bottom. Can you, go back? can you go back so I can scan it? I didn't do it right. Oh yep. yeah, sure. There you go. Okay, I'm gonna pop off this screen so that we can see. All right, look, it's populating. So I've um, created this as a word cloud so we can kind of see what things surface oh. most often. I love whoever put evaluate because that's what I thought too. <laughs> I was like, oh wait, probably should think of a different word. Oh yeah, so good. Cool. So good. There, so we're seeing some words get bigger. Measurement, progress, impact. Lots of unique words, metrics. I love this, this is so cool. So cool. Good enough, <laughs> LOL. Let's see, what are these? Fine tooth comb, these are some good ones. Behavior change, goodness, it'll just make you a little nauseous, but it's great. Um, <laughs> assessment, accountability, ROI, ooh, good one. I actually wish I thought of that, cool. Oh, and some things are getting dropped in the chat box if you couldn't, if you didn't click on the word fast enough, but yeah, cool, cool. All right, I'm willing to shut up, but that's an awesome tool. I'm glad you did this. Fun. Okay. I'm going to, um, I appreciate you all dropping those words in and seeing it kind of spin around and see what comes to the surface for folks in terms of evaluation. And when I do this with other groups, um, these words are all different all the time. And so people come to evaluation with all kinds of different um, understandings of what it is. So I'm gonna move to the next slide and you'll still use the same access code. And I'll give you that QR code again, just in case you don't have it. And then I'm just gonna ask you one more question. So I understand what evaluation means. Pretty simple, straightforward. Yes, no, somewhat. And I'll just give a couple minutes for folks to sort of um, give a sense of where they're at. Cool. So, Lots of folks know what evaluation is. That's awesome. I love seeing that. And it's always really unexpected for me because again, um, there's lots of different ways to understand evaluation. Okay, we'll keep populating this. Um, but I wanna take a minute just to do a, um, a quick quick exercise just as we um, are seeing these numbers kind of change as more and more folks input what their um, relationship or their understanding of what evaluation means. Um, and just do a super, super quick exercise just to get everybody kind of, um, again, on the same page. So I want you to either take a piece of paper and jot down or close your eyes, whatever you're most comfortable with, and then just go through, um, through these kind of questions um, and just reflect on, on these questions. So think about a time when you've had an idea. Okay, you want, you want to achieve something. You have an idea and you want to achieve it. That's your goal. Okay, if you're thinking about your goal, then think about um, when you tried out that idea, when you tried to reach that goal. That was your implementation. Then think about you have your goal, you tried it out, then you observed what happened. You took in, um, you took in the information about what happened during your implementation phase. That's your data collection. That's you collecting data. And then think about, 
taking that data and then judging what happened. Was it a success? Was it a failure? Is there room for improvement? That's evaluation. That's you doing evaluation on your own goals. And then you took away a lesson for the future and that's learning. So that's a very, very basic and simple example, but it's evaluation um, thinking at a very basic level. Um, it's a really clear example that everyone has the capacity for evaluative thinking. Um, if you do this as a group exercise, which is really fun, um, it requires a little bit more time, the group can start to identify certain patterns that emerge and that's uh, systematic analysis. So also evaluative thinking just at a bigger scale. Um, a lot of people that I uh, talk with or work with have a lot of fear around evaluation. There's a lot of, um, they've either don't understand what it is or don't have a good sense of it or didn't have a good experience with it. And so there's a lot of emotions tied to evaluation. And I want to just like pause and, um, and reflect on that for a minute because it's not something that um, that you should feel spun out about. Um, it's something that you can do. And I, I don't want you to kind of get caught in the jargon or, um, or feelings of, uh, of misunderstanding or fear around evaluation um, because you're starting with what you know and you already know that you can engage with evaluation because you do it every day. So from a uh, more academic perspective, what's, a, what's the definition of evaluation? Well, in the field, there are lots and lots of competing definitions, but the one that I use, that I use most often and like the most is one by Michael um, Quinn Patton that says program evaluation is the systematic collection of information about the activities, characteristics, and outcomes of programs to make judgments about the program, improve program effectiveness, and or inform decisions about future programming. So these four points here are the ones that I think are really most important to communicate about what evaluation is. Evaluation first and foremost is systematic. It's intentional, it's planned, it's purposeful. So as we demonstrated just a few minutes ago, it's already our human nature to always be evaluating things. Um, program evaluation is simply a systematic way of going about that. Um, so first and foremost, it's systematic. Secondly, it's informative. Um, data collected enhances uh, knowledge, it guides decision-making, and the goal of collecting that information is to improve or, or from my viewpoint and positionality, it should be an intention, is meant to improve. It's also essential. Um, it's often a requirement by funders or by boards or governing bodies or stakeholders. Um, people wanna know what are the impacts or the effects of the work that's being done. But in addition to being a requirement, it's also just really beneficial. Um, we all wanna do good work. Let's prove it. Let's showcase it. Let's learn from it. Let's use it to leverage success. Good evaluation demonstrates success and the foundation for continuing on and doing even more good work. It doesn't have to be just a thing you do because you have to do it because it's required. Um, Motivations are diverse for engaging in evaluation. It's something that you can do because you believe in a program and you want to prove its successes. It's also reflective practice. Um, it's a chance for you to stop and think about um, what's working, what's not, how can we engage with stakeholders differently? How can we change or improve the program? Um, and it can also be a tool for systemic change. So these are all the reasons why evaluation is um, is what it is and, and why I believe that it's really important. Um, one of the things that um, I use this slide from a, a, screen a screen capture from a grant blog um, that states that grant evaluation is the most overlooked and misunder misunderstood part of grant programs. Um, 
So being able to uh, share information about what grant evaluation is and what it isn't um, feels, really, feels really important. Um, there are different types of evaluation, um, different ways that you can engage with an evaluation process. And I jumped a few sl slides ahead, but, um, but just to kind of give you a, a grounding in different types of evaluation practice that there are. There's formative evaluation. Um, formative evaluation is when you track progress uh, along the way. It's a way of um, engaging in course correction. So you might have a plan, but you might have to adjust along the way. Um, the path to success is not always linear. You work your way there and you're reflective along the way. Um, so for example, how many people had the best laid plans for a program and then COVID happened? Um, you know, it's a way to stop and pause and reflect on what kinds of changes um, you can and should be making in response to the environment around you and in response to the way implementation is happening. So formative, it's tracking pro progress along the way. Summative is an assessment that comes at the end, um, you know, demonstrating what impact there has been from a program, uh, what could be the long-term effects. There's also monitoring and performance measurement. Um, this is often tied to a lot of evidence-based practice. So if you're applying for grants that require, um, that are utilizing an, an evidence-based approach, um, this is usually typically part of your evaluation packet or your evaluation process. Um, so oftentimes it means tracking fidelity. So how closely a, a program is replicated or reproduced. So you know, how many times, how long, what curriculum is used, how closely a script is followed. Those are all indicators for uh, monitoring and performance measurement. Um, developmental, a developmental approach supports innovation by bringing data to inform and guide ongoing decision making as part of the process, while also building capacity. Um, so helping to build the capacity of the people who might not be evaluators, but who are program staff um, dealing with data. Um, and then participatory, so getting stakeholders involved. Um, so there are different types of approaches to evaluation processes. And depending on the type of program that you're implementing, your approach will look different and the methods will correspond with your approach. Um, for example, if you're writing a federal grant for a teen pregnancy prevention program that requires an experimental methodology, there's not much room for a different kind of approach, but if you're writing a grant for a local nonprofit that's focused on youth mental health first aid, you might use a mix of approaches. You might have a formative approach. Um, you might do a summative uh, evaluation at the end. You might have a developmental approach where you're helping to build capacity for the program staff who are um, collecting the data or learning from the data, uh, depending on what your goals and objectives are. So, um, hey, why is it? Oh, yeah. Make sure we're actually seeing because the slide we're seeing wasn't totally matching up with what you're saying. So we're just curious if you're on the slide you think you're on, like if it's actually showing. Just make um, sure. I am going to. Um, I am on getting. I'm on the screen right now. I might have jumped ahead one more. Sorry about that. They're not moving. So they're, we're on a slide that says the Clarity Assurance Budget. Yeah, like, and I'm I'm just about to get to that slide right now. Well, that's that weird. Works. It's not change. It's not if you're trying to click between slides. We are just on that slide. We haven't seen any other slides. Yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna be on this slide next, and then I should be able to click through to the next slide. So you want to click through just to make sure it works. Yep. Okay. Good. Yep. Okay. So I say all of that, and I'm sure as grant writers, you're wondering, well, that's great and all, but why is this applicable to me? Um, why is evaluation important to grant writers? And I, I see three clear reasons why evaluation is important for grant writing. First of all, it provides clarity. Um, it provides a clear outlining, for, a, a clear outline for defining and measuring an applicant's progress towards goals and objectives. 
Um, it's a systematic way of assessing success and measuring a, an applicant's progress towards achieving objectives. Um, evaluation helps keep projects accountable. Um, if you're not tracking, how will you know whether or not you've been successful? So clarity. Um, secondly, in terms of grant writing and applications, it offers a sense of assurance to a grant maker um, of an organization's capacity and effectiveness. It demonstrates planning efforts. It embeds that accountability into the project. It improves the quality and extent of implementation of key activities. And it informs decision-making about what works and how to move forward, um, maybe even after the grant ends. And lastly, and I think um, not to be understated is that an evaluation has budget implications. And so when you're thinking about um, doing, having an evaluation component as part of your grant application, you really need to give pause to think about um, how you're going to carry it out. Are you going to have internal program staff utilize um, their skills and expertise as program evaluators? Or are you going to hire an external consultant to do that? Um, and there's pros and cons to each of those things. Um, you know, what's the timeline? What are the resources? Um, how are those things going to impact on your budget, those activities? Um, and that will tie directly to one of the things that I speak about in the last bit is, um, is that this budget implication has a lot, this budget piece has a lot of implications. Um, and I'm gonna give you just a tiny little um, snippet uh, of stuff that kind of floats around but isn't really written down. And that is to say that a general rule of thumb is that about 10% of your budget should be allocated to evaluation activities. Um, so just to have a number in mind when you're thinking about um, evaluation. And of course that can change depending on the project, but um, if you are writing a $500,000 grant and you allocate $5,000 for an evaluation, you really need to think hard about what kind of information you need and want to get out of, um, out of that process. So really um, sitting with that budget for a minute and thinking about how you're gonna utilize that line item to best leverage um, data collection and information tracking. So, um, so the budget. <laughs> that's always a that's always a big piece. Um, how can I incorporate evaluation into my proposal? Um, so these are three three tools for you. Hey, one quick question, Kate. Yeah, go for it. Uh, just to see if we could get clarity on this. Uh, Nicole was asking, did you say one percent or ten percent as a sort of general allocation for evaluation type work? Ten. Ten. Yeah. Clarification ten. And yeah. is that split up typically as like, like the bulk of that is in a personnel cost or a, a contractor cost? Is that where the bulk of that is drawn from? Yeah. Yeah, versus I guess depends if you have travel as well, but yeah, so 10% everyone, that's really helpful to know when we put our budgets together. Okay, cool, yeah. carry on. <laughs> um, so I want you to write an evaluation plan, uh, use existing data or obtain new data and develop a logic model. And I'm gonna talk about each of these things in more depth in slides that are coming. So the first thing we're gonna address is writing an evaluation plan. So what is an evaluation plan? Um, it's a description of how a program will be monitored and evaluated. It's an identification of program goals and objectives. Uh, you're going to be um, uncovering what type of data will be collected, who will be collecting, analyzing, and interpreting the data. Um, the frequency for the data collection process, who data will be collected from, and how. Um, it's basically answering those simple questions of what, why, how, and when. So identification of um, program goals and objectives, what are they, and why are those goals the important goals of this project? And then based on your goals and objectives, how will you measure change over time and at what intervals? So it's forcing you to be specific and systematic with programming. It's not enough to say that through our after-school tutoring program, we will change high school students' lives. And 
that's a noble goal. And I know you're all taking Meredith's grant writing class. So you're probably not going to write a sentence like that in your grant proposal. But um, let's pretend that you do, or let's pretend that that's um, a first draft of what you're, where you're going. Um, how do you know that when you've been successful in doing that? How do you know um, what are the indicators that tell you that your program has changed lives? Is it better grades? Is it better attendance? Is it better um, statewide testing scores? Um, is it uh, if it's better grades, does that mean that it's 100% um, of students will get better grades or 75%? Is it better grades in all subjects or better grades in certain subjects like core subjects? So an evaluation plan requires you to decide on what type of data will be collected. Um, and then again, who will be collecting, analyzing and interpreting the data. Um, so some examples of uh, pretty common tools that evaluators use or programs use are pre and post surveys. So being able to track um, if a student comes into an after school tutoring, tutoring program, where they're at a baseline, um, and then a post survey after they have left, what are these certain questions that you want to measure that change over time and ideally you see an improvement. Um, so pre post surveys, interviews, focus group discussions, um, you can track changes in existing data sets, um, which is a good opportunity to move to the next Before slide. Which, do, yeah, yeah. And maybe yeah. you're going to get to this, but Rama just asked a great question. What, has, what have you found from grant ma makers regarding self-report? Because then it kind of doesn't have its, its third party independence, for, right? So just what, what are you finding in terms of that being I hope, Ramo, feel free to unmute yourself if I'm not actually asking the question the way that you were envisioning, but he was. No, you're doing well. A lot <laughs> of the community education yeah. <clears throat> programs that we run, community literacy, uh, is dependent upon the um, participants' post-program self-reporting. Not surveys, not an instrument, nothing like that. It's about them developing a paragraph on what they learn and stuff like that. And my question to Kate was, what have you found to be the credibility of such um, an evaluative, evaluative tool? Sorry. Great question. That is a great question. And I think, so if I'm understanding you correctly, it's the students who are participating are, are um, creating a product that is then provided to the funder. Is that, did I get that correctly? Sorry, I only heard a little bit of what. That's okay. Yeah. No, the, um, the participants are adults uh, okay. looking to increase their ability for 21st century uh, literacy, uh, technological uh, implications and whatnot. But, you know, this is because they're bringing high tech into the city of Pittsburgh, and we want mm -hmm. to best position these adults to help get them out of poverty. But um, the tools that uh, we have found, the quantitative tools, uh, miss the mark as far as getting like what has been changed as far as learning. So a lot of that is dependent on self-reporting from the participants themselves saying that yes, they have found the job or they feel uh, better positioned to engage in an interview, to write a resume and so on and so forth in 21st century literacy language. Okay, so does a funding agency credit the participants' self-reporting or do they want us to develop a tool to measure it? I love your question. I think it gets at the heart of um, a million conversations that I've had over time in terms of a disconnect between funders and programs. And this could be a whole different topic. And I would love to take a conversation offline with you to talk more specifically about that. But um, I will say in a very brief response, um, because your question merits a, lo a longer discussion, um, that I think that there are systematic tools that require, that funders require to be able to um, fit into their boxes and that, um, that are deemed to be more credible. And, and I 
use this because I think that there is a heavy, heavy reliance on quantitative data at the expense of very rich and deep qualitative data. And so I think that I would love to keep talking with you about that, but I'm going to, does that response satisfy you in this moment? Okay. Spot on, Kate, she, he said. And, and the other thing I would add is that this is also uh, building upon itself from the grant writer perspective to help you go pursue additional grant funding. And that self-report is your story, is the piece that has the heart to what you're doing. So I would absolutely collect that. And while it might not completely satisfy what the grantor is looking for in terms of evaluating the impact of the program, it's sure going to be useful for you in all future grant pursuits because that that's where we get to the heartstrings of your impact. It's not this, the percents of this or whatever, right? Like it, that is it, what you're gonna hear from them saying how they feel more confidence. You can't measure confidence, but confidence is a huge piece, right? Of allowing someone to feel- You, like you can absolutely measure confidence. I was gonna say to Kate, <laughs> The thing that I love, if you're if you may if you're making that determination of wanting to fill an evidence-based best practice model and turn qualitative data into quantitative data, the best way to do that is through pre and post testing and to just do do a Likert scale. So you do something like how confident are you with medication management at the time of discharge from a hospital? But then we've done a 30 day coaching practice and how confident are you at the end now that we have your medication box set up? I mean, whatever it is, food insecurity through Meals on Wheels, but you just do that pre and post test and you take that qualitative and then you can tell those stories while you present that data. Boom, yes. drop the yes. mic. Yes. Anyone? <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Tracy, is that Tracy? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, brilliant. Uh, th thank you. Yes, you can take uh, you can take the qualitative data and turn it into quantitative data. You can do that. Um, and you can also utilize to the point of this slide, you know, maybe you're in a cycle where you you are not currently collecting pre and post data. You can still take the data that you have and turn it into um, you know, you still can take that and code it for confidence or um, uh, turn that into something that could help drive your narrative until you get to a point where you have created a tool that can capture that over time. Um, so, you know, what data do you use? I think Meredith um, said what was right here at the bottom of, of the slide, identify the data that is best going to tell your story. What does that look like? You know, what is that data? Maybe it's existing data. Um, you know, maybe you're tracking um, census data or statewide or localized data sets, for example, like a youth risk behavior survey or using your own program data. You know, go through that data and, and figure out what's going well and what can um, we improve. So for example, if you're running a transitional housing program, you might be able to say, our transitional housing residents have high job placement rates at 90%. Um, so the program needs to be enhanced in these ABC ways to maintain or exceed those rates. Um, you might use your existing data to identify where gaps exist and how they will be bridged. So for example, again, if you say our transitional housing residents have really high rates of job placement at 90%, but have really low rates of access to transportation, um, that's also telling a story. So sometimes the data is dirty or not cohesive, and maybe that's the story. You know, really it's finding, um, it's finding those points that are going to tell your story. Um, if you have, if there's time permitting, or if you have the capacity to collect new data in advance of writing a proposal, which that is not often the case, but sometimes that there might be, that might occur. You can do a needs assessment, um, which is just a formal assessment that identifies current conditions and desired services or outcomes. So you can point to that in your narrative and say, these are the needs of our target population, very clearly. Um, if you, have a small population or you're not crushed for time and you have the interest, you could do a quick survey to kind of get a pulse on where folks are at. So 
For example, um, I have a very small preschool in my community where I live and they're they were applying for funding. I was helping with their grant. And anecdotally, I had heard from um, a couple folks around town, parents and families, that they were really seeking some kind of support through COVID, parenting support, like a, a group or some resources um, to support their parenting through COVID. And so I just created a quick um, three question survey that I distributed to parents um, asking them if they were interested in that. You know, I had heard that there was an interest. I wanted to get more information about that. Um, and, you know, so were they interested and would they participate if certain types of support were offered? And so I was able to use those survey results in my narrative, which really bolstered, um, which really bolstered the application. Um, and you can do that in any, you know, we have lots of different ways to do that. You can use Google Forms or SurveyMonkey or Lime Survey. Um, there's lots of ways of capturing that, uh, capturing that data. Um, so the next slide is a logic model. And this is um, something that probably lots of you have seen, but I'm just gonna make sure that everybody is coming in at it um, on the same sort of foundational level. Um, a logic model is just a visual representation of an evaluation plan. It's a roadmap for you. It's a graphic depiction of uh, the relationship between a program's activities and its intended effects. Um, so a good logic model efficiently communicates the overall uh, kind of purpose of a project and serves as a foundation for evaluation planning. Um, this can be a really powerful addition to your funding proposal, um, but only if it's well aligned to your project's narrative description. Um, so this is an example from the Wallace Foundation. Um, there's four very specific things that go into a logic model. Inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. So in this logic model, it says resources, but resources and inputs, they're interchangeable. So inputs, what are the things, what are the resources that are going into your particular program? I'm gonna give you a sample on the next slide. So I'll give you some very concrete examples of what this looks like, but as an overview. So then next from those resources come your activities. What are the specific things that you're gonna to do to achieve your goals? What are the, what are the activities? What are the, um, what's the, what are the things that you're gonna do? What then from those activities, what are your outputs? What are the immediate things that will happen as a result of your activities? And these are tangible products, capacities or deliverables that, re that will result from your activities. And then come outcomes. These are the changes that occur in other people or conditions um, because of the activities and outputs. And then outcomes, if you wanna go that route, they can be broken down um, into short, medium, and long-term outcomes. You can sort those out um, and identify short, medium, and long-term outcomes. Um, here's an example. This is a really good example of a sample logic model for a teacher training program. So for example, the, the inputs or the resources, they've got personnel, they've got um, guiding research, and then their activities. They're gonna um, develop teaching guides and sample lessons. They're going to conduct teacher workshops. As a result of those activities, then they can count the things that are gonna come out of those activities. They're gonna have a number and type of guides. Um, they're, gonna have, they're gonna be able to count the number of participants that attended the workshop and for how long the workshops lasted. And as a result of those, then they're gonna be able to point to some short-term outcomes. So increased teacher knowledge of reading content. That's the first thing that, that will happen to come out of those activities and outputs. And then from there, there they might increase um, positive student attitudes towards learning. And then from there, they're gonna hopefully reach their long-term outcomes of incre increased student reading test scores. So it's a, it's a map. It's kind of mapping you from, um, from your resources all the way to your goals. And you can start at either side, but I like to start at the goals and work backwards. So um, this is a nice tool for you to be able to utilize. Um, and I'm gonna give you some more resources on logic models towards the end. 
Um, I do also want to share with you a beautiful sample logic model. Um, I was in the American Evaluation Association conference occurred last uh, month, at the end of last month. And there was an indigenizing data evaluation or data visualization workshop that was put on by uh, Nicole, Dr. Nicole Bowman, January O'Connor, Stephanie Evergreen, and Mark Parman. And they shared this example uh, from the Lummi Nation of a Lummi system of care. And a logic model doesn't have to fit into these sort of standardized Western academic boxes of you start here and you move linear uh, all the way here. You can represent your vision values, your visions and values through a, a beautiful visualization of a logic model that might fit more accurately and reflect your identity more um, through something that looks more like this. Um, do you have to have a logic model? No, but it is a really concise visual representation and it can be really powerful. Okay, coming in here. Um, what shouldn't I do when it comes to evaluation? Okay, some pretty, pretty easy stuff here. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend that you don't have to do it. Um, don't be vague. Don't kind of write these, um, have lots of objectives or not um, be systematic about uh, how you're going to work towards your goals and objectives. Um, don't guess or expect capacity, especially from internal staff. Um, don't expect internal program staff to have the capacity to carry out evaluation tasks. If there already is an internal evaluator in place, then that's great. That's great. Talk with them, work with them, have conversations with them about how to write your grant narrative and how to accurately reflect an evaluation plan in that grant narrative. But if there isn't, evaluation can quickly become, a, become an overwhelming activity um, for someone who doesn't have the knowledge or the interest in doing this kind of work. Um, for example, I work with some amazing folks who do really good work with teens. And they have flat out said to me, um, I want to focus on what I do best. I want to connect with teens. I want to give them the information that they need to be positive, healthy young adults. I don't want to run data. Um, they want to be in their zone. And I totally, totally get it. Um, and so for teens like this, I would be really upfront as a grant writer and ask, do you have the interest or the capacity to carry out evaluation tasks? I think um, just meeting people where they're at and being respectful of where their interest and knowledge and capacity lies is a really important part of the process. Um, don't leave it as an afterthought. So when you do that, um, it's kind of the same thing as just expecting internal uh, program staff to be able to engage with this task. Um, and then it also has budget implications um, if you leave it as an afterthought and you don't think about it. You know, you're not collecting that pre-post data. You're not be. You're not. You're kind of left with the data that you have. If you just say, "Oh my gosh, I have um, an annual report due to my funder, and I have to demonstrate what our what our um, progress has been over time," um, you get better results, better information when you engage um, with evaluative tasks from the beginning. And then lastly, this is a pretty easy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quickly, just quickly, because you were just taught uh, two questions. First one, I want to bring up that Celia is asking. So if you do, as a grant writer, ask, hey, do you have the capacity and interest to run the evaluation for this grant? And they say, no, I really don't. I just want to focus on what we're good on. Then what do you encourage really making sure that that grant hires someone to do that role? Or, you know, what would you encourage the team, how do the, I guess how the team should handle if that happens, like they really aren't going to do the evaluation very well or enjoy it. So what are their other options? I think having, that's a great question and thank you for asking it. I think it's really important to just have an honest conversation. I think every program is gonna respond differently to that question. Um, and I think just making space for the conversation um, is important. And so if program staff say, no, I don't have the capacity to do this or the interest to carry this out, um, then their supervisors or whomever need to hear that. And there needs to be a conversation about, well, this is, 
you know, this is not only a requirement of the grant, but it's also, it's, it's important for us to know this information, to be able to make those, do those pulse checks or track changes or however you engage in your evaluation plan. And so I think, um, I think making sure that those checking in as a grant person who's writing a grant, sometimes program staff don't even think about the evaluation component. It happens all the time. And um, as a grant writer, it's a nice nudge for that program to be thinking in that direction. You know, do we want to utilize a line item in the budget to hire an external evaluator or does the uh, program staff have the capacity and interest uh, to be able to carry that out? So I, I think that you as an evaluator can nudge that conversation and, and help program staff create space around that conversation. Completely. And then the other question isn't something that you need to answer right this second, but if you can have it on your radar to bring up. Uh, Kristen Carpenter was wondering if you could provide some guidance on how you can use focus groups for evaluation, how to run those effectively. Can the grantee do it or is it best to contract it out? Um, so just giving some like very specific go down the rabbit hole uh, feedback on focus groups would be appreciated at some point. Yeah, I would love that. And I'd love to also take that conversation offline too, because I love focus groups. I do them all the time. I think they're super, super beneficial. Um, I love qualitative data. That's where my heart lies and that's where I'm rooted. Um, and so I think that they're really important and I think that there's a real art to doing them. And so I would love to be able to talk more um, directly and address more of your questions uh, when there's some time and space to do that. If that feels okay. Oops, I was muted. Yeah, that sounds sounds good. Maybe at the very end we can cover that because I'm curious about it too. Um, because yeah, we've been wanting to actually do some focus groups ourselves to learn more about a, a program we're thinking about developing. So yeah, let's make room for it at the end. Cool. Um, yeah, I love talking about qualitative data methodology. It's um, super, it's, it's like I said, it's where my heart lies. So I always love talking about it. Um, I'm gonna do the last, what shouldn't I do, which is um, confuse outputs and outcomes. And I see this all the time. I see it happen all the time in programs. Um, people think that because you can count something means you're making an impact. Um, and that's not always the case and you need to dig deeper. Um, so you're really, you're really asking the question, what are the changes that occur in people or conditions that, um, that you're tracking? Not just how many flyers did we produce? Um, how many workshops did we hold? You know, you're really wanting to dig deeper than that. So don't confuse outputs and outcomes. I, I think that that's a really, um, a really easy thing to take away. Um, okay. Now we're going to check check back in to see if anybody learned anything today. <laughs> so we're going to go back to this um, very same question and ask, this is kind of like our pre post, our own pre post survey for this um, conversation. So scan your QR code, or if you still have it loaded up on your phone, tell me about uh, what words you associate with evaluation now that we've talked about it for 45 minutes. <laughs> Rockin', they're coming in hot and they are a little different than from the get-go. Nice. So we have, cool. oh. We have an electrician running around. He's lost. <laughs> the galaxies can go help him. It's always a fun uh, adventure. <laughs> yeah. Don't burn your house down. Planning, outcomes, impact, or data. Darn, why didn't I think of that one? <laughs> uh, and I would love to, if we have the ability, I don't know, um, Meredith, maybe this is on your end and I might be putting you on the spot, but um, it could be cool to share this back out to the group. Um, yeah. you know, kind of the pre post results so people can see that change over our one hour long time frame. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing that I, I, it's not really related to grant writing, but, um, but thinking about, and it is, 
but um, thinking about how your results are going to be communicated back out to your stakeholders beyond your funders. Um, you know, that's for program staff to consider. How are you going to share that information? You know, you're, you're taking information from people. Um, how are you going to give it back to them? I think there's a real, um, there needs to be some real consideration about, about how to do that. Agree, and something that we're seeing a lot more uh, grant listings and instrumental of the database, as you all know that we use, it's one of the tools we encourage people to use, there's a lot of them, but we're seeing a lot of foundations from private companies, uh, you know, create grant programs, but they're really looking to highlight and share their impact. So, you know, they care in a different way than perhaps the federal agency cares. So it is really important to capture this. So you can help your funder celebrate and really show off their investment in you. So. Agree. Lots of cool ways to use this information. Yeah. And okay. uh, Emmanuel's giving you kudos for a great way of doing a pre and post evaluation. Oh, so thanks. see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. All right. I'm going to move to the next slide. Same question. I understand what evaluation means. Yes, no, or somewhat. Oh, look at that blue going up there. Good work. All right. <laughs> and no no's so far. So lovely. We learned something. Yay. There's yeah. I, I definitely empathize with the somewhats because I feel like it's just there's so much learning to do here that I completely get that. Like there's a there's lot so more much. to do. For sure. There's a lot. And I would love, I mean, for any one of these slides, I could talk for a long time about um what, you know, kind of dig deeper on a lot of those things. So if you want to have those conversations, I, I would love to have them with you. Yeah, cool. Um, well, you're also in the Facebook community group where our students, a lot of our students are at. So I think people that have some, some follow-up questions could do it there and find yeah. you. As promised, I'm gonna sneak onto the next slide because I wanna give you some tools to take away, okay? So um, first and foremost, this is, the Better Evaluation Rainbow Framework is top notch. It's so good, it's so helpful, it's really easy to navigate. It really helps folks um, think about how to create an evaluation plan. It's got drop down menus for um, different types of um, information that you, different ways of um, framing an evaluation, um, different ways of thinking about your evaluation. It's a really cool tool. Um, and I would strongly suggest uh, that you kind of dig into that. Um, the American Evaluation Association, this is um, just another great resource. They have um, a, if you wanna sign up for their listserv, they do AE365, which is like a tip of the day. And they have everything from like how to do a logic model to how to do anti-racist evaluation work. I mean, it's really, there's, there's um, something every day, uh, a tip or a tool or a lesson learned, which is a really cool, um, is a really cool feature. They also just have lots of resources on their website as well. Um, the CDC has a logic model checklist, which is really helpful. Um, so if you go to that website and I can send this around to folks as well, um, or you can screenshot this or just type in CDC logic model checklist and it will take you to, um, it will take you there and help you develop your own logic model. So I'm gonna switch the slide now. Um, and again, uh, what is evaluation? There's a little bit more information on the AEA. I gave you one definition. There are certainly others. Uh, you can dig in and learn more if you are so inclined. Uh, the Council on Foundations has a very specific uh, part of their website dedicated to grant evaluation because um, foundations are more inclined to um, help build evaluative capacity with programs um, more so than other types of grants. So um, I would check out the Council on Foundations resources for grant evaluation. Um, and then just this uh, little section of a website that I have stumbled upon in recent years, how to write the evaluation section of your grant proposal, um, which might be helpful for, for folks out there. Um, the last thing I'm going to leave you with is another kind of homework assignment or tool to take away 
you know, if you are um, program staff or you're a freelancer, no matter where you're at, you can have this conversation with the program to better get a better understanding, um, not only to clarify the writing in your narrative, but also to clarify an evaluation plan. Um, so, you know, how can you have this conversation with program staff to tease out some of the specifics for pulling together your narrative? You could ask the following, you know, what are your project's goals and objectives? What new and existing resources will be used to support the project? Um, so for example, you know, identifying what are those resources? What are those inputs? Are, is it funding? Is it project team? Is it partnerships? You know, you're gonna um, identify all of those things. Then you're gonna ask, you know, what are the main things the project is going to do? These are your activities. Again, are you gonna hold workshops or trainings or camps? What are the products that are gonna be created? Is it gonna be flyers or pieces of art or artifacts or writing samples? Um, what are your short-term outcomes? So what, are, what will occur as a direct result of your activities and outputs? Um, so this is typically changes in knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So for example, um, you know, you have a camp and you talk about, um, part of your camp is talking about protective factors. Um, so a short-term outcome is that youth will increase their understanding of protective factors. A midterm outcome follows from that. Um, so typically changes in, in policies or practice. So then youth engage in relationship building with trusted adults. And then a longer term outcome um, these are changes in broader conditions. So, um, for example, after youth build those uh, relationships with positive trusted adults, then youth are more resilient and have lower rates of depression or self-harm. Um, those are the broader impacts that you're working towards, your goals. And then you can start um, lining out some of those key evaluation questions. And, and this will be part of an engagement strategy if you, if you have um, a, an external evaluator. You know, ultimately, how do you define success for this project? What does success look like for you? You know, you might ask, what are the th are three to five questions that would help inform you about whether or not you've achieved success? And then um, what kind of information and in what format would that information be most useful to serve this project? So those are some of the things that you want to be thinking about as you're engaging in conversation about uh, writing narrative for programs. Um, and those are just a few, a few simple tools that hopefully will help send you on your way. I, I hope that some of this has been helpful for folks. Um, I want to thank you again for your time. Um, I appreciate it. I know folks don't have a lot of it. And so I am very grateful for you all um, listening in on what I had to say and asking great questions. And I am here to answer questions, engage further. Um, my email address is kate at wellspringalaska.com. Um, you can on. find me there. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, we thank you. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat box. So we are on the top of the hour. So if you guys got to bounce, totally understand. But I do want to um, sneak in one or maybe two more questions just because there were some pretty good ones. Uh, Sue, where did it go? Anna. Anna was asking, how do I facilitate this conversation? Wait, I'm goofed it up. Uh, she's curious how she facilitates the conversation of um, setting your objectives and goals um, so that they're realistic versus these like unobtainable, unmeasurable outcomes. Like how, what advice do you have for on the front end um, doing that pre-evaluation of a program to set realistic goals? I love that question. That's so great because I feel like lots of times, and I just had this conversation the other day, lots of times um, we, you know, when you're in a grant writing role, you work with folks who are big picture thinkers. They just, they have these amazing visions and ideas and how they want to change the world. And I think it's so important to hear that and hold space for that and then also kind of work backwards to think about, um, you know, we have this jargon of smart goals, right? Um, so like, what's, how can you measure that? You know, and I oftentimes, I hate reducing things to measuring, but like, how do we, how do we know that we're, that we're doing that? 
So like, what's an indicator? How can we, what's realistic in this scenario? Um, what, uh, what are some ways that we can write down what an indicator of what that might be? Um, you know, how do, an indicator is a way of demonstrating your progress towards the goal. And so I think being able to hear a big picture vision and be able to kind of scale that down into, so what, how can we break this down into like realistic, um, time bound, uh, measurable, um, goals is a really great way to start having that conversation. Yeah, great answer. The other question that builds on that nicely is from Deborah Wright, but I think I might take a stab at answering this. Her question is, would an evaluation discussion take first place in the kickoff meeting? And this is, you know, the kickoff meeting that we kind of talk about, have the specific agenda for, et cetera. Deborah, my answer is no, because that's a very, um, people are going to get into like a really good discussion on that. Whereas you already have all of these things that you really got to get everyone focused on and taking action on. Uh, so I would actually save the evaluation discussion as something separate. Um, so it either happens, you know, in the week or two after your kickoff, or you're doing it in the front end when you're doing your project planning. Uh, so I would not put, try to put that into the kickoff meeting because I think it's just too much content for something that's already a fairly full agenda. Um, so Good question though. Um, great. Well, I think we, um, I think we can wrap it up, but I am encouraging the group for those that are students to post some of their follow-up questions in the Facebook group. Um, we do have a couple other specifics on focus groups. So I thought that'd be a good spot to park that there. Um, and then, and then we can go, go deep there. Um, but thank you so, so, so much, Kate. Is there anything else that you would like to add? No, I am. Um, I'm seeing, I think there was a comment in the chat about kind of educating funders. Um, I don't know. Did I see that? It's I'm kind of scrolling right. through. <laughs> yeah, some, some, we do save our chat so we can go back and look for it too. Um, okay. If we need uh, to find it. Yeah, because I think absolutely we need to, um, yeah, I think there's like a two-way street there, and I think um, I think funders need to need to really understand the importance of evaluation, and also understand the importance of like um, I saw something, I caught something in the chat about it not being burdensome for folks, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's another you know that's an implementation conversation, okay. um, but I think it's an important one to think about how you're not asking more of people. Um, how you can, you know, integrate it more organically into a process. Um, and then again, it's, I'm just going to say, I think it's really important for folks to remember that the, the goal of evaluation is to, is to really be able to like have this as a beneficial thing for your program and not just collecting data for data collection's sake. I think, um, I think really keeping your eye on utility is a good way of staying grounded in that um, to make sure that you are capturing information that's most useful to you and that you're going to act on and use to guide your decision making. Um, and so, you know, I've been a part of other projects where the funder is like, do all of these things. And it's so, so, so burdensome and overwhelming and anxiety producing for program staff. And so um, that's an education of a funder. And that's also, um, you know, recognizing that that data collection isn't the most use, useful or best use of program staff time. So like making sure that you're identifying things that are really useful to the program to be able to showcase success and continue to improve, improve, improve. Totally. So sweet, cool. Well, with that, we will wrap it up. A lot of thank yous are uh, had <laughs> poured into the chat box. So thank you everyone for showing gratitude for Kate and all for knowledge. So that's really rad. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day and week. And for those of you that are doing the 30 day course challenge, we'll catch you Tuesday or Wednesday if you're with the Alaska Press Club. So right on. Um, we've got a couple people saying you'd like to rewatch the webinar. So we'll get out the link for that um, and on, well, by tomorrow, but also it's recorded technically on the Facebook group. So that's actually, we could just go and get it right now. So 
Right on. Sweet. Thank you, everybody. Take care. See you, Denise. Right on. Melody, thank you. See you, Kathleen. Lots of great Cody Liska saying goodbye, Julia Grace. Cool. All sorts of great. This is a rad, probably best attended webinar ever. Thank Sick. you. Right on. Thanks, Tracy, for all your rad contributions. Melody, nice to see you. Looks like you're in not your tiny, the, did you move? Are you not in the, the house anymore? Right on. It's exciting. I'm back in my house now. Back in your house. Cool. Yeah. Deborah, nice to see you. Cool. Anna, Kathy, Sarah, thank you so much for coming. Kathleen and Oriel. If I said your name right, Oriel. Please correct me if I need it. Neil, Marcia, Harvey, Marissa, Debbie, Bernice. Tegan, Jennifer, thank you guys. You're awesome. Cool. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah, you betcha. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Meredith. Thank, thank you so guys much. so much. That was thank awesome. You. Thank you, Meredith. You betcha, bud. See ya. Congrats on your grant. Cool. All right. Talking to myself, mute myself. Thank you so much, Kate. We so appreciate your time and expertise. And I meant to tell you that your earrings are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I um I lost one. I thought it was um I thought I lost it at the beach on a beach walk, and we found it on the street, only minimally run over. So it came back to me. <laughs> that is really cool. I do love it when my earrings make their way back, and you don't have just your supply of uh ones, you know, one earring. Yes. Just yeah. one. I've got a lot of one earrings hanging That's low. Fine. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. Well, we'll follow up with you after this. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Okay. Thanks. Bye.